Welcome to the Castle of Spirits True Ghost Stories Podcast. Hi. Howdy. I'm your ghost keeper, Vince. And I'm the ghost keeper, Jane. This podcast is brought to you by castleofspirits.com, a website that's been around since 1997, Mm -hmm. housing 4,600 and more true reader and listener submitted ghost stories that you can go check out for free, or you can just listen to this podcast because we're slowly reading our way through the gal, the library. Yes. Very slowly. I did the math. It's going to take us years. I did the math. It's going to take us 152 years. <laughs> no way. I, you know, sounds good to me. Oh. Let's see you I do thought you math. actually did the math. No, I just did it in my head. Oh, so it, it's probably way off. Probably. It's probably longer. Anyway, lest we waste any time, mm. today we're each going to read you a couple of stories that we found in the Castle of Spirits library. Jane, do you have stories to read today? I do. I think we have a little bit of a... Th- accidental theme, don't we? we? What's the accidental theme? Well, uh, both of my stories are about driving. One of my favorite things to do when I'm driving home from work on nights when I have to work late, it's dark and it's nighttime. There's very few people on the road. I like to listen to spooky stories while I drive home. That's my favorite time to listen to them. So that's kind of why I chose driving stories tonight. Anyway. Well, if you like driving home in the rain, to some creepy S-H-I-T. I do. You're going to really like the story I've got for you today. This was a story that was submitted anonymously in August of 2007. The title of the story is The Creature in the Rain. At last, I have a story to submit to this site, which is my very favorite ghost story site on the net. Thank you very much. Wow, the net. Old school speak there. Back to the story. I have read every single story listed in each year, and I never get tired of reading them over and over. Anonymous in the USA, you have a lot more time than we do. I have never had an experience of my own, but the other day I was at a friend's house, and her 78-year-old mother related one to me, and of course, I ran to post it right away. I am 40 years old, and I've resided in Georgia all my life, mostly in rural areas. I've heard many tales of haunted houses in Georgia, also known as haints in the South. I was having a conversation with a sharp-witted 78-year-old mother of my friend the other day. She told me that about 26 years ago, in Douglas County, Georgia, she had an experience that she could never forget. It occurred on Lower River Road. If you're familiar with Lower River Road that many years ago, you'll know that at the time, Douglasville was a very rural area long before the mall and shops and long before Lower River was even paved all the way. She had been at the hospital in Lithia Springs, Parkway Regional, which is no longer there, to visit her daughter and her new grandson. She was returning to her other daughter's home. It was lightly raining outside and had just gotten dark. At the time, the road had no streetlights and the woods surrounded the road on both sides. Her wipers were going and she had both hands gripped on the steering wheel her face as close to the windshield as she could in order to see. She noticed up ahead a mailbox near the road and what appeared to be someone or some animal sitting on top of it. As she neared the mailbox, she wondered to herself, who or what in the world could be sitting on a mailbox out here in the dark in the rain? And as she got right up next to the mailbox, she saw that it was a little creature, as she called it. It was only about two to three feet high It was gray, and it was all wrinkled. She said it was wearing a big hat, like an old fedora. It was also wearing a long-sleeved, long nightgown-looking thing, kind of like what newborns wear. She noticed it didn't have legs or feet that she could see. When she got right next to it, and remember, her face was as close to her windshield as she could get it, the creature jumped right onto her car and pressed its face right against the windshield She said it was grinning at her. It scared Miss Becky to death. Not literally. She screamed and jerked back and threw her hands up into the air and covered her face. Her car lurched to the opposite side of the road and luckily it was flat so she didn't wreck. She said a few seconds passed and she gathered her wits and grabbed the steering wheel and pulled her car back onto the road and kept driving. Upon pressing her for more details, she told me that she never looked back to see if the creature was still there or where it had gone. It wasn't on the windshield any longer, that was for sure. She said it had rotted teeth that were horrible. Miss Becky always thought that it was some kind of omen about her daughter, her daughter that was in the hospital, 
or the new baby, but nothing ever happened to either of them. I told Miss Becky that I had read similar stories just like hers on this site, with a creature that is wrinkled and with a horrible grin. I wonder, for as many stories as I've read on the net, what in the world these little troll-like creatures are and why they seem to mostly scare humans that see them. And that was The Little Creature in the Rain from August 2007, submitted anonymously to the Castle of Spirits website. Now I'm really curious to see, the person mentions that there are other stories on the Castle of Spirits website that talk about a similar creature. Mm. I have not seen that. I mean, this is a, the number of stories on this website is staggering. (laughs) It's intimidating to try and read through them. It's shocking every time I find a story that I've read. You know what I mean? Like, right. Oh, I've read this one. That's weird. In fact, I am very familiar with that story that you just read. That's a that's a really good one. Um, you've read the, You've heard this one before. I have. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I really like the description of the creature. It kind of reminds me, like a clothed version of the creature in the uh, what is it, Henry Fusilli painting, The Nightmare. If you've seen that one, it's the the woman in like a nightgown who's asleep and she's kind of dramatically thrown back and there's this little creature like kind of crouching on her chest. Oh, yeah. It's a really old painting. Yeah. From the 1700s sometime. Uh, Something about the description, you know, the wrinkled gray crouched just reminded me of of that painting. It kind of reminded me of uh, Hobgoblins. From the movie Hobgoblins. No, it's much scarier than the movie Hobgoblins. But yeah, I've never seen anything like that in my life. I don't know that I would want to. I'm great seeing a ghost. Show me all the ghosts you got. I don't think I want to see a hunched, wrinkly, gray thing. Especially if it lands on your windshield as you're driving. You're going to have to clean that off. I mean, I'd probably just crash the car and then there's no point in cleaning it off. So just don't crash the car. Just keep going and then tell your story on thecastleofspirits.com. I guess so. If it happens to you. But mm-hmm. first, tell me, because I want to know. Yeah, but be safe. <laughs> Always. All right. Now, that story, for as terrifying as it probably mm-hmm. was or wasn't, I think you may have a story, too. You look like you've got a story that you want to share, and I'm hoping that you do share it with us. I, of course, have a story to tell you. And this story was also submitted by Anonymous in USA. Same person, huh? Mm-hmm. Wow. In October 2003, and it's called The Highway of Hell. For my 16th birthday, my parents gave me a brand new car. It was a silver 2002 Mustang. I was so excited about it that the same night I drove it to Walmart to deck it all out. I had also picked up my friends Carissa and Elle. We were cruising back home at about 10.30 p.m. We were on the outskirts of town on the highway when suddenly this person ran out in front of us. I slammed on the brakes, afraid to hit them, and we looked out the windshield. Besides us, the road was deserted. I was thankful that my new car was okay and that whoever had run out in front of us was gone. The next night, Saturday night, On my way back to the next town, I saw the person run out in front of me again. This time I could tell it was a man. He was slower than before, so I honked the horn. There was another car coming in the opposite direction who honked too and stopped beside me. It was a girl about my age who was from the other town. She asked what that was and I said I didn't know, but he had run out in front of me before. We both agreed that it was some sort of nut from the local bar, and we went on our separate ways. I hadn't given the man any more thought until a month later, when I was taking Elle and Carissa to the movies. It was about seven, and we were jamming to the radio. Suddenly, he ran out in front of us, but this time he stopped in the middle of the road. I slammed on my brakes, but it was too late, and I hit him. We heard a bang on the front and a bang on the trunk. He must have been thrown into the air and landed behind us. So I turned on my reverse lights to see if he was alive. He wasn't there. 
We all looked at each other and agreed to get the hell out of there. I put the car in drive and we started to go. As I looked out my rearview mirror, I saw blood running down the back window. I pulled over and told everyone to get out of the car and get at least 15 feet away from it. As we did, when we turned around, there he was on the top of my car. I have no idea what happened after that because I passed out. When I came to, Ellen Carissa said that after I had passed out, he just lay there and stared at them before a car came along and they both turned to look at it. When they looked back, he was gone and so was any trace of him. From that day on, we've never seen him again but there have been plenty of rumors going around about a man running out in front of people on the highway. I had to sell my car, but the memory of that night still haunts me. And thank you again to Anonymous in USA, October 2003, for submitting The Highway of Hell. Wow. So somewhere out there, there's a a ghost that you can run over? Apparently. Is that a thing? I mean, I can I can see that maybe she made the guy a ghost. Maybe. At first I was thinking, wait a minute, this is not a true crime podcast here. <laughs> We're not, this is not uh, the confession line. <laughs> right, right, right. But may I offer a piece of advice to Anonymous and anyone else listening? If you think you hit someone, ghost or not, don't just say, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, you get arrested for that. Yeah, I know. And it's not it's not a nice thing to do either. No, it's not a good thing to no, do. No, no, no. If you hit somebody on the road, you hit no. Stay in the car, call 911. The fact yeah. that he was on top of the car though mm-hmm. was kind of creepy. Staring at them. Like I could just see that face. When I was when I was reading that, I could see his face like he's trying to play dead or something, but he's watching them intently and and they look away and look back and he's just gone. That's a crazy story, though. I've never heard of a story like that where you hear about ghosts that haunt the side of the road. Yeah. Ghosts that cross in the path of cars, but the car goes through them and Mm -hmm. there's no impact. Mm -hmm. But in this case, there being an impact, I don't know if that's, is that something that anybody listening has ever heard of before? If you have, let us know, because I've never heard of that. I have heard of stories where there's, you know, the sound or maybe the feeling of an impact but then they look and there's no one around and there's there's no damage to the car. I don't think that's completely unheard of. Okay, but this is definitely a story that if the writer is out there, mm-hmm. we know we can we think we can narrow it down because you had a, a friend named Carissa and L. <laughs> you didn't say that you'd change the identities. So anybody out I, there knows somebody from twenty years ago that hung out with Carissa and L. <laughs> Get in touch with that person and tell them to get in touch with in, us. In just USA. Anywhere. Okay. It's time for you to read another story. Do I have another story to read? You know, in you fact, better. I do, actually. You better. I have another story to read. Okay, good. And I think it's going to be even better than you can imagine. Oh, well, I'm imagining that it's pretty good. For this story, we travel all the way to Ireland. This story is called The Hitchhiker. My story is based on an event which happened to my father about five years ago. My father's a truck driver here in Ireland. He has been for the past 30 years. He told me this story shortly after it happened to him. I actually think he finds it hard to believe himself. My father was driving from Cork to Dublin. It was a night run, about 3.30 a.m. It was a cold November night and there was a fair bit of fog and mist all around, so the road was fairly hard to see. My father doesn't recall stopping on the road, but suddenly he was aware that there was someone sitting next to him in the truck. He didn't feel afraid, and he felt as if he had stopped and picked this person up, even though he hadn't. My father and this person, who was a man, had a bit of a chat My father couldn't help but notice that this man was very similar to my grandfather. My grandfather had passed away some 20 years previously. The man said he wanted to get out of the truck, so my father stopped and the man said, Mind the road ahead. 
My father nodded and was on his way. The road was thick in fog and there was a humpback bridge ahead of him. He heard the man's words in his head and decided to slow down to be very cautious. He reached the other side of the bridge and had to quickly grind to a halt. There, standing directly in front of him, was a policeman with a police car directly behind him blocking the road. The road ahead was flooded and the policeman was there to warn people. Yet, because of the poor visibility, the policeman could hardly be seen. My father reckons that the hitchhiker saved this man and possibly my father's life, as my father would not have been traveling at such a slow and cautious speed had it not been for the hitchhiker's words. And that cautionary tale was brought to you in November of 2002 from Ireland, titled The Hitchhiker. That was so good. That was so creepy. Because I, I pictured myself, you know, driving home from work at night, dark, and suddenly, just out of nowhere, there's somebody sitting in the passenger seat. And for some weird reason, I, I mean, I'm weirded out by it, but I'm just okay with that and carry on a conversation with them. That's such a creepy and strange thought. Have you ever been on a long drive at night where you're kind of fuzzy in your recollection of the events of the drive? And I'm not talking about a night drive where you may have been sleepy and possibly fallen asleep at the wheel for a few seconds or had some sort of a waking dream. I don't think so. Is that something you've experienced before? I did once. So tell me about that. I was visiting California, where my family lives. This was on the event following my grandmother's death in 2004. I was visiting. You stayed home to -hmm. care for the beasts (laughs) of the castle. And I was out hanging out with my old friend. We'll call him Ted. (laughs) We'll call him Glenn, (laughs) even though that is his real name. (laughs) But pretend pretend you don't know that. (laughs) So I left this Glenn's house well after midnight. I was stone cold sober, was not tired, was driving a road that, even though I hadn't been on it for about five or six years, I was very familiar with. There was nobody on the road. This is highway, well, the old Highway 101, Monterey Highway, coming from San Jose and moving southbound. Is that the piece of road known as Blood Alley? I think there is a piece of road known as Blood Alley everywhere in the world. (laughs) Okay. That area in particular was not, however. But it was creepy. Like I said, this was the old highway. The freeway had long moved a couple of miles east. And so this was the road you took. If you didn't care about going 65, 70 miles an hour, you can go 45, 55. I just liked the the drive because it was more peaceful and seemed a little safer late at night. As I was approaching an intersection, I remember seeing a lot of debris on the side of the road and kind of into the road itself. And this is where my memory is kind of hazy because I don't think that I really saw what I thought I saw because if I had, I would have pulled over. What I think I saw was the wreck of a car Mm. that maybe had come to rest on the side of the road after colliding with a tree or something. And it seemed like there was a lot of wreckage strewn about the road, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember getting into the left lane and going around it slowly. Then later, I remember telling you about it Mm -hmm. and telling you, you know, in all seriousness, saying, I think I might have died in a car accident and everything that I'm experiencing now and I'm talking to you is imagined or... Maybe part of your life flashing before your eyes, right before the moment of death. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I had to have you assure me over the phone that I was not, in fact, dead. Yeah. 
that you were in fact talking to me. Mm -hmm. And it took me, well, you know, I guess the next, by the next morning I was okay. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I slept very well that night because I actually thought I've spent most of the night wondering if I was on the side of the road somewhere. Yeah. And ever since then, periodically I remember that. And I think, is it possible that I'm still living a sort of dream that flashes before my that that is flashing before my eyes oh, yeah. as I'm lying on the side of the road in an accident that I don't remember having yeah. been involved in. Yeah, that's a really because I mean, there's no way to prove that. There's it's a really scary and interesting, you know, thought experiment. But ultimately, I guess it doesn't really matter because you're having the experience. You're living a full life, whether it's in a flash of a moment of a dying brain or whether it's actual, it doesn't seem that there's any difference. So might as well just lean into it, right? Exactly. But I'll always remember that. I, I think what happened was that there was just a bunch of stuff on the road, maybe mm-hmm. from an accident and it had been cleaned up or poorly cleaned up. The cars mm-hmm. had been taken away. But I guess I was in a weird state of mind. You know, I was there for for my grandmother's funeral and all that stuff. But it could also be that maybe what you saw was, you know, the, the aftermath of a wreck, like you said, that had mostly been cleaned up except for some debris in the road. But maybe you said that you kind of pictured a, a a car having gone off the road and maybe hitting a tree or something, maybe that's what happened. And maybe somebody did die and their spirit is confused and was still there. And you came along and it kind of latched onto you. And maybe that's why you had those thoughts and those feelings because you kind of had a, a spiritual hitchhiker of sorts. That is possible. So it wasn't your feelings and your thoughts about having died that night but this kind of spiritual hitchhiker. When I think back about it, I still am pretty uncomfortable in the fact that I don't know what I saw on the side of the yeah, road. I, I totally can't forgot remember. about that. But it's just one of those things that that is just one of those things. Mm. But enough of my All roadside right. yep. night drive horror stories. Do you have a story to tell I do. or I to share with us? One more story. And my story also comes from over the seas, from a country. That starts with the letter I. No way. But my story is called Greetings from Iceland. And it was submitted by Thornstein L. Helgeson from Reykjavik in October 2001. My father works at the air traffic control here at the Reykjavik airport. He designs and fixes hardware for the glide slope beacons, which are tiny sheds most often three, containing instruments to guide the airplane to the runway via the guide slope beam. One night in the winter of 1984, my father was on emergency duty and got a call regarding a beacon at Keflavik International Airport, about 20 miles from Reykjavik on the Reykjanes Peninsula. At that time, the Iceland International Airport was inside the U.S. Navy base. That night, the weather was terrible. There was a blinding snowstorm when my father and his co-worker headed out. The beacon was, at that time, on the northern tip of the peninsula, and to get to it, they had to take a road that led them down to a beach. After driving on the beach a while, talking about the task ahead, they suddenly saw two figures standing right in front of the car. My father, who was driving, slams the brakes on, and they both got out, thinking they'd hit somebody. Looking around and under the car, they find nothing and hurry back into the car. They both confirm what they saw to each other and head on, really spooked. About two minutes later, a silhouette of a man and a child appeared in front of the car, and again my father hits the brakes. They rush out and take a look, not really liking this situation and like before, find nothing. At this point, the storm was subsiding and they just decide to hurry on to the repairs and check things out on the way back. They found no trace of anybody but themselves being there that night. 
The morning after, my father and the other guy bring this up during a coffee break. One of the others then tells them that this same thing happened to him once when he went out there during a snowstorm and he saw the very same thing. He told of how he was alone and he saw something three times. So he did a little research and found out that sometime in the 1500s, a ship that was coming from Denmark sailed right into a huge storm around there and sank. Rankinus Peninsula is one of the most stormy areas in Iceland. Well, that was not all. On board the ship were mostly rich people, and when their bodies washed up on the shores, they were robbed. Now some of the bodies had been in the water for some time, so the robbers had to cut some of the jewelry off their fingers and from other parts of them. Therefore, they roam the shores in that area on stormy nights, looking for their stolen parts. I might add that the Reykjanes Peninsula is supposed to have more ghosts than the whole country combined, according to Icelandic folklore. So with all those storms and nothing but lava and ghosts, that makes a pretty scary place. Greetings from Iceland. So thank you to Thornstein L. Helgeson from Reykjavik for submitting that story in October of 2001. That kind of reminds me of the movie The Fog, John Carpenter's yeah. The Fog. Yeah, it, it really does. Where a ship of lepers crashes into the rocks and all, the, all their booty, all their gold sinks to the bottom. Lepers? I thought they were just pirates. No, there were a colony of lepers. Oh, I somehow I missed missed that part. Okay, we're watching the fog again. <laughs> I just th thought it was pirates. And when they met, that's why they. Well, I mean, you know, they're well. They were rotting because they've been underwater for, for decades for a very long time, yeah. uh, a century, in fact. Mm -hmm. But yeah, clearly, I'll have to sit up and point out. See, see, they're <laughs> lepers. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with being a leper, mm -hmm. but you know, a hundred years, hundred and <laughs> however many years ago, back in 1880, they seem to have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that story. I like the idea, like he says at the end, about, uh, you know, with all those storms and nothing but lava and ghosts, it makes it a pretty scary place. And I already have this kind of mystical fascination with Iceland, and it just seems like such an otherworldly place to me. I'm sure, you know, it's a place just like any others, and the people who live there are people just like any others, but... The land, like the physical land itself, just feels mystical. Feel, it feels mystical or like anything can happen there. Yeah. I feel an attraction in my heart. So you could say that mm -hmm. I have a heart on for oh, Iceland. Oh, boy. And I want to go there someday. I really, really do. But who's going to care for the castle? Who's going to care for the furry animals that roam the halls? And who is going to feed the ghosts. I'm sure that there's a castle sitter somewhere. We just need to, we'll put out a call on Fiverr for, for a castle sitter. <laughs> well, I saw a billboard today for visiting angels. I wonder if they have one called visiting demons. Vince. So that is everything we have for you today, friends. But this is not where we say goodbye because we really want you to join in the conversation. You can do this a couple of ways. You can just, you know, find us on social media and tell us what you want to tell us. At Castle of Spirits. Yeah. Tell us what you want to tell us, whether it's a question, a comment, a story, whatever. Or you can head to thecastleofspirits.com. You can submit your own stories. Remember, while this is a paranormal and a ghost story website, we really are open to accepting all of it as long as it's true. At this time, we are not accepting pieces of uh, fictional literature. Uh, but if you have a true story, just weird, what the heck was that? Maybe a ghost, maybe a cryptid, maybe a UFO, maybe a black-eyed child, maybe who knows? Just send it to us. We're, we want it. We'll let you know. Yeah. What, what it is. We'll let you know what category it falls into. We're the experts. Just tell us your story. We're not and we'll experts of it. anything. Oh, yes. I'd say we were experts. Yes, uh, yes. No. Um, 
Or you can head to the lounge if you just want to submit like a comment, a question. There's a there's a bajillion, a literal bajillion ways. That and you all can these, contact us. all these are found just by going to castleofspirits.com, dot mm-hmm. poking around the website. You'll figure out how to contact us real quick. You figured out how to tune into this show. That's right. You're a resourceful person. <laughs> but do submit your stories. And maybe we'll read them on a future episode and share it with the world. And if you like this podcast, if you want to support this podcast, we're not asking for money. Mm-mm. We're not asking for donations. Mm-mm. We're not asking. Well, I am asking for a pat on the back occasionally. But, you pat yourself on the back. And I do. But all you have to do is listen to the show, mm-hmm. visit the website, mm-hmm. and tell a friend. We always say, If you like this podcast, tell a friend. And if you hate it, tell two enemies. Either way, the word gets out. Mm -hmm. And oh, ho. And and speaking of out. I hear the music. Yep. That music, as you all know, Mm -hmm. is our cue to feed the ghosts. Mm -hmm. Hey, Vince. Yes. Ask me what I'm feeding the ghosts tonight. Jane, Mm -hmm. what are you feeding the ghosts tonight? (laughs) Buschetti. Buschetti. (laughs) Buschetti. You know, I think you're ready for prime time. And for dessert, I scream. Oh, wow. Did you write this stuff down or are you just making it up on the spot? I stole these jokes from somewhere else, I'm sure. Well, you know what they say? Every comedian. (laughs) Apparently they don't say anything about that. Every comedian. Every comedian.